Well, howdy there, Internet people. It's Professor Leach again. Today, we're going to talk about subtraction as the inverse of addition. Then we're going to go on to division is the inverse of multiplication. And then we're going to talk about exponents being the inverse of some other kinds of exponents. It's all exponents after that. So uh, I want to talk about subtraction as the inverse of addition. The way we want to think about it is that subtraction undoes addition. So if, for example, I start with, say, um, 7, and I do a plus 5, I end up at 12. So start with 7. then add five, we end up at 12. If we take our, where we end up with, if we wanna get back to where we started, we do the inverse operation. The inverse of adding five is subtracting five. So if we start at the end and do the inverse of adding five by subtracting five, We'll be back where we started. Subtracting five is the inverse of adding five. Subtracting five is the inverse of adding five. And so we end up back where we started. That's what an inverse does. It gets you back to where you started. If the operation is put shoes on, the inverse operation is take shoes off. So this gets us back to the start. In math, we wanna learn things backwards and forwards. So we have to know how to get back to the starts. This is gonna be the way we think about addition and subtraction as inverses of each other when we start doing things like solving equations. We're trying to figure a bunch of stuff happened to the X. We have to perform inverse operations to figure out what happened to the, uh, by looking at what happened to the X and undoing all those things to get back to the start. Where did the X start at? Subtraction is the inverse of addition. So subtraction occupies the same place in the hierarchy of operations. In the hierarchy of operations, subtraction sits with addition. Oops, not SIF. Subtraction is not a SIF operation. Subtraction sits with addition in the order of operations. So when we said things like uh, about addition before, subtraction sits at that same place. Multiplication distributes over addition Multiplication also distributes over subtraction. So multiplication distributes over addition. Multiplication also distributes over subtraction. So we're thinking of it as the same thing. Another thing that you may have seen in your algebraic history is subtraction as the inverse of addition expressed in a very strange way. So we can also think of subtraction as the addition of opposites. So this is something that you may have seen before. Subtraction. is the addition of opposites. I don't know if this is still done where you take something, an, ex, an expression like uh, 12 minus five and think of it as 12 plus 
a negative five. I'm not sure if this is something that is still done. And usually in a class of say uh, 20 people that you're talking to, three of them are like, oh yeah, no problem. And just kind of immediately assimilate the information. But the other 15 are like, oh, why don't we just say 12 minus five? And then the teacher's like, oh, because it's addition of opposites. It's like, oh yeah, but it's still subtraction, right? It's like, oh yes, but it's addition of opposites. And then they force you to write things like this following some funky rules and it never quite lands. So if this doesn't sparkle with the group, that's okay. It doesn't need to. If you, if you know 12 minus five is seven, we can understand addition, the uh, subtraction. We already understand subtraction as the addition of opposites. It's just another option we have for thinking about subtraction. All right, so subtraction undoes addition. Subtraction is the inverse of addition. Subtraction sits with addition in the order of operations. So whenever we're evoking addition, we're also invoking subtraction. Any questions? So we need to look at the relationship between subtraction and addition. This is something I like to refer to as three-part relationships, and it helps us understand. Uh, it helps us understand the relationship between addition and subtraction. So, I'm going to write down. Uh, I'm going to take a very simple statement, and I'm going to write it in two different ways, or sorry, three different ways, two alternate ways. We know that five is equal to two plus three. I hope we all know that. I'm sure we all know that. I've seen you all do this, so we're good. This contains other information. I can say two plus three is equal to five, but it also tells us some subtraction information. We also know that three on its own is equal to five minus two. These two statements contain the same information. A relationship between two and three and five with addition. It's how two, three, and five are related with addition. Five minus two is equal to three means the same thing as two plus three equals five. And we can also write a version for two and say that two is equal to five minus three. So this is just three part relationships. Five is equal to two plus three, three is equal to five minus two, or two is equal to five minus three. We can even visualize this one. We can visualize this because addition is very visual. If I think about things on a number line, and here's zero, and here's two, and here's five, then I've got two here from two to five is three. And so I have two plus three is equal to five. So if I want a part, I take the whole thing five and subtract three and that's gonna be two. Or if I start with five and subtract two, I'll be left with three. So three part relationship, how addition and subtraction are related. We're trying to reinforce moving forward. We're trying to reinforce our thinking in terms of the order of operations and in terms of solving equations a nice future topic that we'll have. Any questions? In the style of my algebra is just arithmetic class, I've said that subtraction is the inverse of addition. So now I'm gonna say division is the inverse of multiplication. Division is the inverse of multiplication.
inverse again. What that means is that we could think of one thing, way we could think of this is that division undoes multiplication. Division undoes multiplication. If I start with five and I multiply by three, if I start with five and I do an operation of multiply by three, we'll end up at 15. Then if I take where we ended up and do the inverse of multiplying by three, which is to divide by three, we'll get back to the start. So the operation of multiplying by three and the operation of division by three cancel each other out and take us back to the start, just like subtraction undoes addition, because that's what an inverse should do. Since division is the inverse of multiplication, division and multiplication are so closely related, division sits with multiplication in the order of operations. Division sits with multiplication in the order of operations. Things that we say about division, sorry, things that we say about multiplication are now things that we will also say about division. So when we say multiplication distributes over addition, division also distributes over addition. So just like say um, five times three plus two is equal to five times three plus five times two. If I have a division problem, let's say, um, five plus two divided by seven, that's this, I can distribute dividing by seven to the five and to the two. So I can write this as five over seven plus two over seven. These are both examples of multiplication and division distributing, sorry, I forgot what I said. These are both examples of multiplication and, and division distributing over addition. So we can split this fraction up into these two parts by distributing the seven. Any questions? Just like before, when we could think of subtraction as the addition of opposites, we can think of division as multiplication by reciprocals. Division is multiplication by reciprocals. This is something that we're familiar with. For example, if I have, uh, let's say, uh, seven divided by two thirds, we know that the trick is to multiply by the reciprocal because division is just multiplication by reciprocals. That's because division is the inverse of multiplication. This is just seven times three halves. Two thirds and three halves are reciprocals. Reciprocals is the word for a multiplicative inverse. Multiplicative inverses have a product of one. That's why that makes them inverses. Because one is the multiplicative identity. Because multiplication by one is the multiplication that doesn't do anything.
Any questions? Similarly, we have similar language with opposites. Opposites are additive inverses, inverses under the operation of addition five and negative five. Because when we add opposites, we end up with zero, which is the additive identity, because adding zero is the addition that doesn't do anything. That's more structure than you needed or wanted at this point on a Monday, but it's there, so I feel like I need to call it out. Similarly, with multiplication and division, we have some three-part relationships. So we have three-part relationships for multiplication and division too. Not the part relationships, three. And I'm gonna do the same thing that we did with the two, three, and the five, only this time with the two, three, and the six. I'm gonna say, I'm gonna point out that six is equal to two times three, but I get two division statements out of this as well. I get that two is six divided by three, and I also get that three is six divided by two. So if two is six divided by three and I wanna solve for three, three is six divided by two. If two is six divided by three and I wanna solve for six, six is two times three. The reason that I use numbers like this and not more examples of equations is that I wanna tie, when we start solving equations that have this kind of form and we go from one form to another to decide what to do, it depends on what we're solving for and there are three, not just two. So if the X is down here with the three, I know to get the x by itself, I put it where the three is and it's six divided by two. And this will help us understand the relationship between multiplication and division. And that will be more important to solving equations than some mechanical do the same thing to both sides. Because that raises the question, what thing do we do to both sides? Any questions? Because we don't want to solve equations like robots. We're trying to make our robots more human. Let's not try to make our humans more robotic, like we have been in math education for the last, what, century? All right. Any questions? Comments? Snide remarks? It's important to understand these relationships because the most important math problems that come along show up on Facebook and their order of operations problems. And it's very important that we not fall into these order of operations trap problems. So I'm gonna pick the most recent one, although these come up all the time. So the most recent. Uh, the most recent one I think was like six divided by two times one plus two. So this is the most recent one. Does anybody, does anybody recognize this particular one? six divided by two times one plus two, and your friends got into this big argument, and half your friends are like all nine, and then the other half your friends are like all one, and then the half of your friends that are like all, no, it's nine, all have degrees in math and science, and all your friends that said it was one dropped out of school, and you don't know that you should probably weight one side of the argument a little heavier than the other one. You know what I mean? 
I was like, oh, hmm, I guess we'll just have to agree to disagree, which is not a tenable position when there is a correct answer. So the correct answer is don't answer this question. Whoever posed this question, they didn't want the answer. They wanted half your friends to say nine and the other half your friends to say one and they wanted you to fight about it. The ambiguity lies in the, the phrasing that we use, PEMDAS, which is trash, which kind of implies that, oh, doesn't the multiplication go before division? And the answer is no. Multiplication and division sit together in the order of operations. We could come up with some kind of generic rule for saying, oh, we must go from left to right. But that still is not as good as thinking this is six divided by two, divided by two makes multiplying by one half, then if those are gonna be the same, doesn't that one go first? Plus, if you go back far enough in math text and how we used to write math, when you write this division symbol, it means you're dividing by everything that comes after it. There used to be a set of implied parentheses after that division symbol even though this multiplication says, no, that's not how it should work. So this problem exists to cause arguments. That's why it should not be answered in this form. This expression exists to start fights. In this form, it needs to be ignored. It is a question being asked in bad faith. It's not being asked because someone wants an answer. It's being asked specifically to cause a fight. So, the reason that I say this is that if I want you to do the division six divided by two first, I can write it in such a way that will remove all doubt. Suppose I want the division to go first. Let's suppose this was my goal. I wanted you to divide the six by the two first. Instead of writing six divided by two, and then just say times one plus two, I could write the question in such a way that I remove all doubt as to what needs to happen first. If I do this, there is no question that I want you to divide the six by two first. Now there is no ambiguity in this problem. Six divided by two is three. One plus two is three. Uh, I can't remember what it was. Three times three is nine. No question. Adding those parentheses removes any kind of doubt. I don't have to rely on you remembering some weird set of rules. I don't have to remember that you remember PEMDAS, but remember that M and the D are in parentheses. So it could be also PDMAS. I don't have, we don't have to do any of that. No question, this is equal to nine. Six divided by two is three. One plus two is three. And three times three is nine. But let's suppose I wanted you to divide six by everything that came after it. I want the two times the one plus two to be the denominator. Suppose I wanted the two times one plus two, all in the denominator. Then instead of writing six divided by two times one plus two and leaving it up to you, I say it's six divided by this group. I put parentheses around what I want the denominator to be. And now I have removed all doubt as to what I want to happen in this problem. Six divided by two, oops, these parentheses are still there, 
2 times 1 plus 2 is 3. So this is 6 divided by 6, and the answer is 1. So when someone comes along and asks, what's 6 divided by 2 times 1 plus 2? You have to ask, what do you mean? And if they're like, oh, oh, no, I just mean that. What's the answer? They're trying to start a fight. They're trolling. They're arguing in bad faith, and they need to be ignored. Any questions? Don't fall for it. If you see someone say something on the internet and it just makes you mad, that's what they want. They just want you to be mad. If you want to not be mad, you have to ignore that person. If you want to try to help out people in the, in the future, you say very publicly, this person is just trying to pick fights. They don't care about what they claim to, be care, they, to care about. They're just trying to get us to argue nine versus one. And then there's like one person like, well, I, I said North Carolina. I don't understand the problem. But the expression as it, as it exists, we have rules. And according to our rules, the correct answer is in fact nine. No question about it. These people coming up with the, uh, one from this expression are incorrect unless they went through a time machine a couple hundred years. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. When you write a division symbol, everything that comes after it and the expression is in the denominator. And we'd have to be like, oh, not anymore. Then they would probably be like, all right, nine. But if we want to remove all doubt, the best way to do that is to just speak clearly, write clearly. Say what you mean, mean what you say. Any questions? Anytime you see an order of operations problem on a social media site, no one is asking a valid question. They're just trying to start a fight. Don't let them. Say, do you mean this? And then put in some parentheses. Or do you mean this, where there's some other parentheses? If they say, well, I don't know, what if it's without? It's like, well, no, no, no. Where do you want those parentheses? I'm not letting you start a fight. Any questions? Comments? Snide remarks? Incidentally, those people that put up two different calculators that do different things, those calculators operate in different ways. Just like if you get in some cars, the um, stock under your right hand is what turns on the windshield wipers and you move it up and down. But sometimes in some cars, there's a stock on the left side and you have to twist the end of it to turn on your windshield wipers. Which one is correct? Hmm? No, they're just operating differently. The calculators are operating differently. So that is a continuation of just attempting to start a fight. Don't let people do it. And if you wanna be at, uh, positive about it, call them on it. So you're trying to start a fight. That's not acceptable around here. Get out. And if you're like, well, ooh, I'm just asking questions. Anybody that just says, I'm just asking questions, just kick them out. Any questions, comments, Snyder Mark? All right, so that's how we want to think about the order of operations. Tomorrow in 820, we're gonna do um, kind of some more exercises regarding the order of operations. So we're gonna get into more details. And then on Wednesday, we're gonna start involving some variables in all this stuff. And then maybe we'll even talk about inverses of exponents, which are just other exponents. All right, so that's what's coming up Tuesday and Wednesday. So don't fall for the internet fights. Anyway, it's just a thought. Y'all have a good day.